Let's get started. My name's David Bursell, and uh, I am the Vice President of Business Development here at MobyTherm. I have with me Mr. Marcus Terran, President, CEO uh, of MobyTherm. And uh, the title of this podcast for today is How the Industrial Internet of Things is Changing Remote Monitoring. But before we dive into that topic, I mean, I just introduced you very briefly, Marcus. Maybe you can share just a little more detail to that background because you've been uh, involved in this remote monitoring uh, and you started MobiTherm years ago. How about a little right. introduction? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Hi, everybody. So, yeah, I started MobiTherm in 1999, um, late October. Um, and uh, we did the infancy steps of remote monitoring, if you will, using uh, thermal cameras. Um, but uh, in the truest sense of remote monitoring, it, it, it wasn't really that remote. I mean, remote, remote monitoring at that point was more of a, hey, I got a machine out there uh, on the factory floor and I want to get the data back to the control room. That was the, the sense of remote monitoring at that point, I guess, right? So. <laughs> running some cables to the sensors, getting it back to a computer in the control room, and then displaying some data uh, on the screen. That was uh, probably the extent to, to where it got uh, on the remote monitoring side, I would think. Gotcha, yeah. And if and if our audience hasn't picked up on this yet, you, I, I, I detect a slight accent. I will never get rid of that one. <laughs> 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 right. Yeah, I'm. I was born and raised and educated in in Germany, and uh, came for a one year project to the U.S. in 1996. And I always joke that I've never finished that project. <laughs> <laughs> never turned back. Right. <laughs> yeah. Excellent, Marcus. And <clears throat> I guess at a very high level, can you can you share with uh, with our audience? I mean, I explained that I work for MobiTherm. You work for MobiTherm. You actually started MobiTherm. What is MobiTherm? Right. So it is a company. Um, the, the 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 name comes from motion vision thermography. That's where the name MobiTherm comes from. Um, originally, uh, um, our our official corporate name is Epsilon Technologies International. But the the problem is nobody could ever remember it. So I, I came up with a fictitious business name, which is MobiTherm, that is more in alignment with what we're doing, what we're focusing on. So we are a, a you know, advanced thermography solutions provider, if you will. We deal with thermal imaging cameras that can see heat and um, doing the, the software uh, to process the images that are coming from these cameras. Um, so we do... Um, we don't do any any handheld sort of thermal inspections. We do everything fixed mount, 24/7 automated monitoring, and have a lot of uh, different solutions around thermal imaging. I really, essentially, I really love that <clears throat> that name, Moby Therm. And when you when you explained to me the very first time what it stood for, it was like, oh my gosh, yeah, that's a no brainer. I get it. Motion vision thermography. My background is in infrared. I've, I've been working in thermography now 23 years plus. Uh, previous to working for Movie Therm, I worked for a very large manufacturer of, of infrared imaging technology. And uh, just so the audience knows how I was introduced to Marcus is the company that I worked for, we, we were great at making infrared cameras, but we needed partners to work with who could create an end solution for customers. And this is primarily on the fixed sensing side, on, on the handheld side where you're taking a camcorder style camera. Um, it, th those, those solutions are, I, I don't wanna say easy, but it's usually the camera and some software and then a trained thermographer who's taking a handheld camera, going out and doing an inspection, collecting data, doing the assessment, whether it's a piece of equipment or, <clears throat> machinery, electrical, whatever that may be, but they're 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 taking imagery, they're doing an assessment, creating a report, and then producing that report. On the fixed sensing side, we produced a fixed camera. 
and we could sell that to a customer, but really that doesn't do much for that customer until you're integrating it into something, you're developing a software, you're doing an installation, you're, you're programming conditions, alerts, alarms, whatever it may be. And that's, Marcus, how you and I met really was, how do we take this fixed camera now and provide a complete solution for, the, for an end customer? Yeah, exactly. And yeah, that's, uh, I remember back in the days, uh, we we were working uh, with uh, Ross Overstreet back in the days that switched <laughs> to, to FLIR um, and kind of pulled us in with a need for a particular customer that, that wanted some extraction of automated sort of, uh, you know, temperature measurements for a project. And, and he was approaching me and said, hey, can you guys develop something like this? Here's, here's, here are the requirements. And so that's how we got started with the whole thermal imaging world, if you will, which was at that point new to us. And we got really quickly hooked on it because it's just fascinating technology where you can actually make uh, heat visible. I mean, it's really mind boggling once you start mm. playing with it. And even some 22 something years later, almost 23 years by now, um, I still see uh, the same excitement here from engineers, you know, being exposed, some of the newcomers the first time to thermal imaging and they're looking at the stuff and they just can't stop playing with the technology because it's so fascinating. Yeah, I, I, uh, I always think of thermal imaging as kind of like the 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 newest oldest technology, right? On um, it, yeah. it it has been around. I don't want to say forever, but fifty years plus, it's been around. Right. Thermal imaging, with its roots, you know, grounded in you know military and government type applications. Most people think of those, but it's uh, it's it's evolved. It's developed. Uh, price points have come down on the technology, making it more uh, accessible. Uh, as, as that's happened, new markets have opened, but it's still just a fascinating technology to play with. And uh, not only that you can produce a thermal image of something, so you can see a, a visual representation of a thermal profile of something, but but being able to take cameras that are thermographically or temperature calibrated so that you can actually extract you know uh, quantitative temperature information off of the that imagery to me has just always been fascinating yeah i remember back in the days uh, when we started um, the market was still very limited because of the cost of the price point of these cameras I'm, i remember going back to the like the the FLIR A A twenty M and A forty and you know being oh in the thirty gosh. forty thousand dollar price range, so we had a very hard time. We we had the idea of using it for for automated uh, sort of imaging and, and and remote monitoring, but the problem is if you pair this with a business problem, you know it has to make financial sense um, to the application. You know what what how I always say like how expensive is the problem that you're trying to solve, right? Um, and if if the solution to it, um, you know, has a return on investment that takes, you know, two, three, four years, that may work well in in, in countries like, you know, Europe and those kind of things where they're um, actually, you know, they're working on the much longer time horizon. But in the U.S., it's usually, you know, 6, 12, 18 months is a good time frame for consideration for a cost point for a solution. So that was still a struggle. So there, we were limited to some very specific, um, you know, high value sort of targets when it came to to developing solutions but this has since changed dramatically i mean we we can deploy cameras that are as as inexpensive as as a thousand dollars now and and you know some lower resolution but but at least you know they they have some place in the industry for for some condition monitoring and so that's it's it's quite exciting nowadays because now now it really it has tremendously opened up the the applications that we can solve uh, with this and um, also in conjunction with now this this whole remote monitoring you know iot based topic that we're discussing here you know yeah i i i think back to the days <laughs> you mentioned the what was it the a20 no a320 a20m i mean the there was like, yeah. yeah there was an a40 camera as well i mean these things were like huge boxes almost like the size of a shoe box yeah and um, yeah, very expensive, very large. And um, I remember we were just kind of getting 
into automation, you know, as we called it uh, back then cameras. And um, I guess back then, uh, working on the manufacturing side of things, I would always envision an automation or remote monitoring application being, okay, there's a camera installed somewhere, and then there's somebody watching that camera output. <laughs> yeah. You guys, what you guys were, were, were you know, uh, the reason why we needed to connect with partners like you is to remove that person who has to sit in front of that monitor and watch that camera output. That just is not scalable and not a not not a very <laughs> effective deployment, right? Right, right. It's the the operator assisted automation, so to speak, right? Where the, <laughs> the human still makes the decision um, and misses a lot of things because they get fatigued if they're staring at a screen for eight hours. And it's also relatively subjective sometimes yeah. you know, when they're looking at things. So there was really the need um, you know, to automate this and also to be able to archive the statistical information uh you know and, and and have data records that they could pull and say hey how did we do on the same run last week you know and then kind of go into this whole statistical process control sort of arena with with the the data points that we were able to extract and the exciting thing about using cameras too um compared to thermocouples was that it's the first time it was non-contact right so Mm -hmm. Yes, there were parameters around, but the problem is they they were limited to just a single spot sort of measurement, and and everything in that single spot was you know natively just averaged essentially, right? So if you it was great if you were doing a continuous web application where the entire web had the same temperature or near the same temperature, and you were just monitoring trends. But if you had a, a more complex application um, where in the field of view of the um, of the parameter, you had multiple temperature uh, regions, it would just give you the average temperature back. And that wasn't that useful where with the advent of, of uh, multi-pixel sensors like a camera, you could actually distinguish between colder regions and warmer regions and, and extract max temperature, min temperature, you know, and delta temperatures. And so it, it, the whole the whole game got a lot more exciting with, yeah. with, uh, with cameras, right? Yeah. So Marcus, can you... <laughs> Can you describe what what was uh, I guess what what did one of those early uh, monitoring systems look like? What what was all the hardware involved? What was all the you know the cameras? Maybe even like how much manpower did you have to invest? How what did they look like? What can you describe so, it? Yeah, absolutely. The I still remember those days, if you will. It was. Um, it was everything was at its infancy step. So even I mean we're considered a machine vision integrator nowadays. Everybody is used to, uh, you know, having smart cameras, having having great vision tools. Even if you program something, so there's pre-made functions for everything you need from image acquisition to, to to measuring a line profile to to doing a blob analysis or or what have you. Like all the, you know, the the standard stuff that that everybody is used to. Um, everybody is spoiled these days because you have these little building blocks and, and, and you, you call yourself a machine vision integrator by just stringing these functions along. But nobody really, I, I wouldn't want to say nobody, but few people really understand what's going on under the hood, right? So back in the mm -hmm. days, these these tools did not exist. You know, nowadays you have like OpenCV and, and all of those packages that, that everybody that grows up in this generation that kind of knows um, you know th these tools and you can just click them together and it's not a big deal so to speak even though it's still it's still quite involved it's it's being often underestimated but um back then there was nothing you know there was some academia white papers of people that have done some i mean crying out loud people have used analog cameras back in the days still right um <laughs> and doing image processing like just digitizing the analog video was a challenge right there, there were very few frame grabbers available, and 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 let alone uh, any digital sort of uh, machine vision tools. So we had to literally design everything pixel by pixel basis from scratch. We had to write every vision function that we needed mm -hmm. from scratch. I mean, the interesting thing about um, using thermal imaging cameras is it's it's actually a mixture between signal processing and image processing because you actually are measuring temperature behaviors over time. And if you extract this on a pixel by pixel basis, 
it is more closely related with a um, signal processing task than it is actually with an image processing task. Um, image processing typically is, uh, even though if you if you're processing a video stream, it's it's a picture by picture, um, and then you're extracting some some 2D image information and you're making an analysis. You may be measuring the the width of something of a blob or a device or you know based on some edge detection or something. Whereas for the most part in in thermal imaging, it's different. You 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 analyzing the temperature behavior over time. Maybe um, you, you're you process heating up at a certain rate, you know, or cooling down at a certain rate, or whatever you you, you may want to measure, and so it becomes a blend of of uh, signal processing and image processing, and and neither one was very well developed back in the days. I mean, signal processing was um, ahead of image processing certainly because, you know, you had um, temperature sensors and, and and anything else there. But so we were kind of blending the two. And writing things from scratch and 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 running these things on, you know, a, one of the earlier Windows machines, you know, um, and it was it was quite it was quite interesting. I remember our first system literally running on a Windows 3.1 OS. Oh you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a blast from the past. Wow. Right. And everything there was also no um, th there was no there were no standards. So yeah, yeah. you had maybe a standard physical interface, like I remember back in the days, like Firewire or something or LVDS, but there were no standards in terms of uh, machine vision. So you had to literally pick up pixel by pixel and decipher what that manufacturer uh, of that camera dreamt up in terms of how the pixels are being, you know, conveyed to you, if you will, over that interface. And then you had to reassemble everything based on some proprietary documentation, if you even had access to it. Um, and they were looking at you strangely, like, do you want to do what, you know? <laughs> 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 and then doing all of this. So yeah, we were battling so many different things. So the lack of uh, machine vision tools, the lack of, uh, uh, you know, logical protocol standards. So we had to work around all of this. This became a massive engineering project, a month on just getting a solution together. You know, this is <laughs> really, so we can really appreciate nowadays tools, you know, when when it comes to something like this, right? And, and I remember joining the the uh, back in the days it was called the AIA, the Automated Imaging Association of America back then, which is now has grown to a global um, sort of an industry association. And um, I think in the beginning there were I think 60 people, 60 members. Uh, when I joined, um, and now they're they're nearing 1,200 or something, um, and uh, yeah, and, and and out of this came lots and lots of standards for the machine vision world and and certification programs and everything else. But it was it was quite exciting to see the the entire industry growing and developing standards and 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 you know leading to to quicker turnaround on developing solutions for 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 customers. Amazing, yeah. So let's. Let's talk a, a little bit about IoT or if you industrial Internet of Things. Um, there's lots of buzz about this. There has been now for for a couple of years, but um, we're we're really starting to see some real impact in um, how leveraging Internet connected devices is really simplifying, changing the work that you've been doing. Uh, and also the uh, experience on the customer side as well, the customers that you've been serving, how how it's impacting and changing them. But before we get into those details, like maybe you can describe, help our audience understand what what is Internet of Things. Maybe you can distill that down it, 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 so that they can understand at a basic level what is the industrial Internet of Things. Right. Yeah, so let me, in order to explain that, let me back off. So the, the internet, as everybody knows it, um, really just consisted of home computers or personal computers, right? Connected via a vast network around the world to some servers, exchanging information, you know, having internet relay chats in, 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 in the early stages where you can log in with your 300 baud modem and... <laughs> I remember downloading the first image. Um, it was like the most fantastic experience. Three and a half hours later, I had like a 200 kilobyte <laughs> uh, 
JPEG downloaded or something like that. Um, but in the traditional sense, the, the, the internet was really just, um, you know, made up of, of a bunch of computers connected via this, this vast network, which they called the internet. Um, now, in the recent years, people are basically, they, they, they started utilizing this, this, this interconnectivity around the world, um, you know, in, in conjunction with, with the remote monitoring needs and, and started to put embedded devices on the internet, right? People may know, uh, you can buy a fridge from some company, ABC, that that now has a monitor built in that tells you when you're out of milk or something. It has a little camera built in. And when you go shopping, you can actually remotely look at the content of your fridge at home. Like, oh, yeah, the, the, you know, I'm out of milk or I'm out of eggs or whatever the case may be. So it, it is just the 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 exchange of, of information. But, but having now smart devices um, connected to the Internet was then later coined as the Internet of Things. Things really refers here to anything, any um, whether it's a phone, whether it's a um, you know a device, whether it's your sprinkler system now that monitors hmm. yeah you know y y your garden, you know the, the the soil humidity or or the weather or something like this. So um, there's an, an indefinite amount of things out there that are now have internet connectivity. They can be networked, and I think by now, um, embedded things have now um, all out outrun or outpaced PCs on the internet. I think there's you know hundreds of thousands of more uh, embedded devices now on the internet compared to PCs. So this is really, you know, the the idea is really everything is going to have some sort of internet connectivity, right? Um, so that's kind of where the the, the the phrase was coined Internet of Things. It's not no longer the Internet of PCs. Nobody yeah. called it that way, but that's really what it was. Now it's now it's called the Internet of Things. And and, and then from that came there, there was a lot of uh, hobbyists dabbling in that space and still are where they like just, you know, home automation where they were like, hey, is my garage door open or closed? How often have you driven away and you're like, oh. Did I close the garage door or not? Right, and now you're like, oh, and, and, and then you have this thought <laughs> percolating up there, and you're like, sometimes you turn around, and you're like, you know, so so though now there's sensors there that can just tell you this stuff. You look at your phone, you're like, oh yeah, it's closed or whatever. So later on, um, the the industrial arena um, looked at this and say, hey, how can we utilize that for industrial purposes? And that's where we're going, tying back into the whole remote monitoring. Where they're saying like, well, the the plant manager has the need to know are all of his machines running okay, right? So now you can sprinkle a bunch of sensors on your machines and make sure um, they're running um, up to spec. You know, they're operating. Uh, you know, is there any downtime? Even if you have like a CNC machining operation, like a machine shop, like you could measure what's the utilization of your machine park, right? To just say, hey, how efficient am I running my operations, right? So all of those things, it's this, these are all data points. This is all knowledge that you can essentially tie back into the internet and then overcome the limitation that we had in the past where you had to be at work to know these things. Now you can actually be anywhere in the world because you have your cell phone with you, which is an internet connected device, one of the things on the internet, if you will. Um, and now you can access that information just about anywhere in the world. As long as you have internet access, you, you can do this sort of things. And out of this came standards. There, there were, um, you know, certain um, communications protocols that were developed out of this thing. Uh, you know, MQTT is one of those, where you have subscribers and publishers of data that made um, networking these devices a lot easier and, and, and everything else. So, so this, you know, out of this has grown the IIoT, the internet, or the, the industrial internet of things now where um, there's there's cloud providers out there that provide cloud platforms. You can tie your data into this thing. Um, and then there's sensor providers and, you know, and then there's there's companies like us that that combine all of that into one solution where we recognize that our customers may either not have the time or they don't have the technical ability to to make all of this work because it's it's in and of itself fairly complex. But we kind of um, have made it our mission to simplify this and really just create valuable, you know, remote monitoring systems. Uh, also, with uh, the use of of our thermal imaging technology, and and yeah. bring this to market essentially. 
Let, let's drill into that a little more because that's that's interesting, uh, Marcus. <clears throat> and I love the uh, the smart sprinkler uh, system. By the way, I happen to have that, and and <laughs> it it's amazing because now not only is uh, my watering and of my lawn and all that done automatically. But it's 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 become intelligent in it because now it's it's even predictive because it's tied to the weather forecast. So if if it's forecasting rain, it just it shuts off. I don't have a rain sensor. It just shuts off because it's it's tying into the weather forecast, uh, right. which is it's amazing to me that it that it does that. I, and it's, so water usage goes down, fertilization you know impacts or you know, those things go down. It's it's just uh, so I love it. It's a much smarter way or approach, but I've seen that evolve just like you've talked about how in industry it's evolved. I mean, I at one point in time, I did have a little rain sensor out there. It was a smart system. The rain sensor would detect yep. rain. It'd get wet. It'd turn <laughs> things off. Very reactive, though, instead of proactive or predictive in some regards. But the, the question I want to ask you about is... You know, many of these applications, software, they're even leaving the PC now. And they're, they're, you talked about things on edge. There's even software and applications residing in the cloud. How, how, how has moving essentially the, the smarts to the edge and into the cloud impacted you uh, and the solutions that you build for monitoring? Yeah, very, very good point. Um, and that, yeah, it wasn't, evolutionary step for us right because as i said before in the very beginning stages we would spend literally months of of engineering to develop these solutions on on a less than perfect uh, pc platform at the time with with no tools with it was very cumbersome and very expensive to do that sort of thing right um nowadays um we we deploy what we call uh, intelligent gateways. Those are little embedded computers, again, things on the internet, if you will. Um, and, and in terms of IoT terms, they call that the edge. So the edge is really, call it the factory floor in industrial terms, right? Anything that happens on the factory floor. So the sensors are on the edge, right? The the gateways are on the edge. So anything that's not really particularly in the cloud is, is on the edge, so to speak. So it's called a gateway is an edge device, right? So, or a PC that sits there or any other computing device, it's called an edge device um, for, for the listeners that don't, that are not that familiar with it. Um, and um, so there are um, intelligent sensors available, such as even some of the thermal cameras these days that talk protocols, like I mentioned before, like MQTT. So you could conceivably have the camera directly talk and connect to a cloud server without anything in between other than an internet connection. However, um, since there are still so many sensors out there and, and often an application becomes valuable if you add and introduce a ton of different sensors because you have different needs for different knowledge on the edge, if you will, if you wanted to measure different things from a, from a tank level to humidity to temperature to whatever. Um, it, it becomes more and more necessary, in my opinion, to, to have an intelligent edge device, such as a gateway, um, so that um, you can um, essentially um, aggregate what these sensors are delivering um, and, and add some intelligence to that before you even bring it up to the cloud. So the, the, the intelligent gateway can make decisions, right? Now mm -hmm. you, you could, it's it's almost a philosophy kind of a point of view because you could also say, well, why don't I just do everything in the cloud? And, and, and you could, I mean, you could, you could propagate all of that data to the cloud and just make the decision up there and, and have this, this massively complex cloud system there that does all of this thing. Um, we have decided not to do that. Um, and the reason for that being is um, we, we recognize that a lot of these um, IOT systems, uh, especially in the industrial arena, people, or companies are very afraid of cybersecurity or, or you know, the breach of such, where um, you know, with all the cyber war and everything else going on in the news and everything else, I mean, it's a real thing. People are being taken down with ransomware and all this kind of thing. So anything that is being additionally connected to your infrastructure, to, to, to intranet in, in the company, 
now would then have to be managed by your IT department. And then their concerns are, okay, how secure are all of these devices that you're now connecting to my network? And then the issue becomes, well, the IT department, they are very much geared towards PCs and maintaining PCs and switches and typical IT um, infrastructure. Whereas if you're putting industrial devices on there, they're getting a little spooked because they're not very familiar with what that is and what they can and cannot do. So that creates friction when you deploy a system. So we have come up with a solution there to say the best um, prevention against any cyber attack is to sever a physical connection between our system and the customer's infrastructure. Because if it's not physically, physical con physically connected, you cannot... Um, you cannot hack it. It's just not yeah. possible. You know what I mean? And no matter how secure something is, there's always a backdoor. Some some super intelligent hacker can always break no matter what security. They, they, they will exploit something. But if it's physically not connected, it's impossible to hack. So we have taken that route as an option and said, okay, why don't we provide our own internet connection? We don't depend on the customer anymore. We have our um, cellular modems and provide our own internet connection. So you know nobody can can do anything about that if you will and it's also secure and it has it's built in firewalls and and, and cyber security and encryption and all those kind of things built in so we have that as an addition to to our systems however the reason and I'm circling back around to why are we doing intelligence on the gateway is because if you do all the intelligence on the cloud it requires a lot more data bandwidth especially mm. if you're using cameras and everything else, you would have to bring all of that data into the cloud. Now you need a high bandwidth data connection. So IoT traditionally has been very low bandwidth. You're just getting more or less event-based data. Like if something goes wrong, you're getting an alarm. You don't have to worry about massive amount of data being pushed because data still is expensive. You're paying, you, you know this from your cell phone plan, the bigger the data plan is, the more you pay per month. Yeah. So that's the same thing with our cellular phones or cellular modems. Um, we have different plans we can choose from. And, and we actually administrating these plans to our customers. And therefore, we, we decimate the data on the intelligent gateway. So between the gateway and the sensors, it's still high throughput. And we have responsiveness in real time. And if something happens, then we push that data at a faster rate to the cloud to keep the customer informed about what's going on about the situation, to create that situational awareness. Uh, but, um, you know, 99% of the time, nothing happens. So we just, you know, update the cloud every five minutes, maybe, or, or whatever the case may be, but but keep the data load really, really low because there's no point in, in pumping up data that does not contain any event-based situation or situational information. You know what I mean? So that's how we segregate um, and, and, and manage the data load um, to our cloud. You know, it's different. There's different applications out there, which, which is falling under the umbrella of big data, where you have terabytes of data being pushed. Um, you know, that does exist as well. And there's a reason for those kind of applications, but this is not what IoT is. IoT is really just meant to be um, like the peace of mind, um, something is monitoring your process, uh, you know, or operations or whatever the case may be, and it just reports occasionally what's going on. And if something happens, that's an event, and therefore then you're going to be notified, you know. So that's kind of a different philosophy of of a system architecture there. Yeah, okay. So earlier I mentioned in the old days, somebody may be sitting in front of that monitor that has the thermal imaging uh, or the infrared camera output, and they're they're watching the screen and determining if there's a problem or not, and then alerting someone. Nowadays, it's an intelligent gateway that's doing it on the cloud, and then that's sending the notification up to the to the application and alerting the end user. Right, exactly. We're doing it on. I guess it could be limitless number of sensors, though, right? I mean. Yeah, it's it's huh. essentially it's essentially endlessly scalable. Yeah. And and the cost for the infrastructure on the edge, what the customer pays for is is literally limited to 
the 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 investment to the you know for the for the sensors and and yeah. the gateway is a small embedded device that doesn't cost that much and the beauty of this is the the IT department is being kept out of it <laughs> which a lot of <laughs> Listeners can probably no appreciate, <laughs> right? No offense. No offense I mean, IT we are, we are, in a sense, we are IT people too. Yeah. Um, but but yeah. I know what the concerns are, right? I mean, their job is to keep everything smooth and running and secure. Yeah. You know, we don't want to create an additional headache with with especially with systems they're not familiar with and they have never been certified or trained on. So we keep those things separated. Um, and and again, since those are not Windows based platforms, they 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 don't really fall under the um, the responsibility of, of IT in that sense, as long as they don't touch their network. Um, so that makes the deployment super easy. It keeps the infrastructure price very low um, and, and everything else is being handled in the cloud. There's no stuff to be updated. There's no stuff to be maintained. You know, I get these questions quite often from the customers like, well, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the lifetime expense going to be, you know, for, mm -hmm. for maintaining the system? And I'm like, well, there isn't really anything there. And in addition, as a as an added benefit, you, you you're getting these um, health monitoring services from us. You know, somebody's here monitoring if every sensor is communicating, if the gateway is up and running and communicating with statistics running on the back end that that the customer doesn't see. We 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 see CPU usage, we see uh, memory usage, we see you know were there any hiccups. We we can monitor all of these things. We see the the SIM cards, we see the data plans, we see the signal strength, we, we have access to so much data on our end, on our dashboards that the customer is not even exposed to, but that tells us how well is the system performing. So it's really another one of those peace of mind situations, whereas in the old days you had a, a chunky PC sitting somewhere, you know, there were constantly Windows was running patches and updates and breaking something and and the IT department got in there not to harp on the IT guys, but they would put uh, virus scanners on there and then the next thing wouldn't work. And it was just pulling out your hair sort of support issues all the time. And we have completely solved all of that with with our approach, you know. So an amazing evolution. I mean, you, you've you've described how it's changed things as an integrator and a solutions provider and 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 just kind of finished up here talking about the impacts to the customer or the individual on the receiving end um, and if i could summarize those it, it sounds like better security mm -hmm. uh less maintenance headache if you will and even cost it sounds like uh, uh uh, lower cost to the to the customer as well, and, and then just improve situational awareness across the board. Right. Yeah, the cost of deployment is is really low. I mean, you, you do get a subscription with all of these services and and data cloud storage and all those things to so you can maintain historical data and all of these things, but it's it's fairly fairly low cost nonetheless. Yeah. If I if I think about the old days. Um, a rule of thumb we had is about the 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 camera cost. You know, you double the camera cost for just the additional infrastructure you needed to run the cameras. Back in the days, it was like you know, you had fifty thousand dollars in camera. You can you know bet that you're going to have another fifty thousand dollars for software and server or PC and everything else running in addition to that. And then you ended up with a high maintenance sort of a mm. system there. Um, nowadays, it's a fraction of the sensor cost is what the the edge devices are going to be running you. You know, it's 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 super inexpensive, and 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 you get the additional benefits of like you know maintenance free, and 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 built in support. Most of the time, you don't even know that you needed support because we 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 see the the health status of of these devices go in, change something. And and the customer doesn't even know about any of this happening. You know, it's, it's a very like a very smooth sort of an operation. You know, yeah. that's 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 interesting. Seems very powerful and unique in the sense that not only are you getting the the sensor information, measurement, whatever that is from the like, and infrared camera would be the temperature, uh, but you're also being able to assess the health of the sensor itself as well. Is it operating properly? Is it up and running? Is it shut, you know, 
So you're you're not only getting the output from the the sensors, but also the health of the sensor itself. Exactly. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Again, to contrast this with traditional systems, typically you would get this from a vendor. They would deploy it. They would do the the site acceptance test and run this off, make sure everything is working, and then they would leave the site and you're on your own with that system. Often we have seen cases where somebody accidentally bumps a sensor or cuts a cable or unplugs something. Mm -hmm. And for a very long time, they wouldn't even know that a sensor was down, sometimes months. And obviously the system can't alarm anymore if if, if the max temperature or, or whatever the, the, the physical phenomenon is that they're measuring, isn't being reported, so your the sensor may drop down to zero, and and the system is like, oh, everything is fine, and then all of a sudden, like, oh my God, we haven't even been monitoring for the last two months or something because somebody ran with a forklift over the cable or something happened, yeah, and or some maintenance guy unplugged the power to something and didn't know, you know, silly things like this, and they go completely unnoticed, you know, and God forbid if something would have happened during that time, you would have been flying blind, whereas nowadays. We almost get an instant message at our service center here and saying, hey, customer so-and-so at this location, sensor, sensor three is offline. And that's happening almost in real time. And we're like, oh, what's going on there? Let's go in. You know, we go in remote into the um, into the gateway and checking on things. And you know, if we can't resolve it remotely, we, we're going to be on the phone notifying the customer says, hey, you have an issue on sensor three. You may want to check the wiring or something like that. You know. And so the downtime, you know, being unknowingly for two months versus like a few minutes is, is you know, a tremendous improvement there. And again, this this peace of mind where like, okay, you know, even if something happens, we're going to know about it right away, you know? Yeah. Excellent. Excellent, Marcus. Um, I guess as we, uh, as we, we, we kind of wrap things up here, I, I've got some other questions that I'd like to, um, throw your way, Marcus. I mean, we've seen some amazing evolution. You've seen it as a solutions provider from where things were 15 years ago to now. I've seen it on the infrared camera sensing side, sensor side, as I worked for a manufacturer in the past to where we are today. Um, what do you think's next? What do you, th what do you think's coming? I mean, I, that's kind of a very subjective, right? Question, but what what do you where do you think this is heading? Yeah, that's a that's a very uh, uh, interesting question. So, I mean, we see obviously already a, a strong move towards artificial intelligence, right? So, mm, yeah. that's another um, you know evolutionary step where um, certain things that you measure aren't as simple to understand as, hey, the temperature is over 100 degrees, give me an alarm. You don't need artificial intelligence for that. That's a simple threshold. Yeah. But there are there's definitely things where, for instance, we see this in 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 the early fire detection world, looking with a camera at um, you know, at a pile with a hotspot could form. Well, how how does the camera know the difference between a hotspot and a forklift driving in front of the camera with a hot exhaust pipe? You know, it's yeah. still a hotspot. The camera doesn't know the difference. So in order to prevent, um, you know, false alarms, the worst thing you can have with a system that's supposed to alarm you is constant false alarms. You know, um, it's like the boy that cried wolf. So obviously, mm. eventually, you're not going to believe the system anymore, or you're just going to turn it off because you just get annoyed with constant alarms. So that's really a, a big no-no for these systems. Uh, but that problem is not easy to solve because you have to have the knowledge that what's in the view of the camera right now is an expected hotspot. And that one is okay versus the one that's not okay. Mm. That is, uh, you know, on the surface, it seems like, oh, well, it's a, you know, it's a forklift, of course. Yeah, but well, cameras don't, don't have any intelligence typically. I mean, they can, but, you know, so that's kind of where AI comes in and says, okay, now you can recognize that this is the vehicle and and filter that out and say, well, don't report on this one because we know that's a vehicle and it could be hot. You know, so those are things we're going to be seeing more and more of um, in that world. Also for condition monitoring, where you know there's um, if you're doing a vibration analysis on a bearing of of some machinery that's running, 
there's a certain noise pattern that's normal. And if it goes outside of something, um, you know, you could have an AI tuned in and, and say, look, um, under normal conditions, this frequency pattern looks this way. But if there's noise happening every once in a while, we, we know that's not normal, for instance, right? I mean, there's there's all kinds of mathematical models out there, um, but they fall short sometimes as well because there may be different loads on the machine. The noise pattern may be changing and it's still normal. And, and again, going back to the whole false uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, creation of false uh, alarms. So AI is definitely, I think, on the rise there that you can, you know, teach, you know, situationally uh, what what's going on in a particular case, you know. But um, the the one drawback still on the AI side is that a lot of people underestimate is the the vast amount of data that's needed to make AI um, reliable. You know, it is fairly straightforward getting an AI system up to 80, 85% certainty on something, but maybe 90%, but the last 10% or the last 5% is very, very tough to get really, really good. So you need tons and tons of data unless the model already exists for teaching the AI. So um, you would have to collect a vast amount of data and train your AI model, you know, and make it better over time. You know, there's there's certain situations where, you know, in in um, Six Sigma manufacturing, for instance, there are situations where you, you need to be 99.97% accurate. Uh, trying to approximate this with AI is ultra difficult, yeah. you know, because the AI is really modeled, um, you know, based on reasoning like a human being. And human beings, are, I think they have tested them to be, let's like, say, driving a car. Human beings are approximating, I think, 86 or 87% in terms of accuracy of making decisions in a car. Nowadays, um, you have you know self-driving cars, AI, that is better than that already, and people are still freaking out of not being perfect there, right? Yeah. Because, like, yeah. because they, they, they have this loss of control feeling where they're like, well, the AI makes the decision, and we have heard in the news about terrible accidents, and then it's, of course, it's, oh my God, and it was the AI. But but uh, forgetting about the hundred thousand accidents that humans cause, right? So that, that that's what I'm saying. That that perception is still there, and, and it's it's true, it's real. AI is a very very uh, hyped up buzzword, but it's far from being perfect. It's not the the silver bullet for everything out there either, you know. So uh, you know you need to understand enough about it to understand is this really the right tool for the job, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. That great answer. I'll, I'll be <laughs> looking forward to seeing some solutions from from Movitherm that are integrating, uh, you know, this artificial intelligence in the future. Sounds like yeah. uh, pretty exciting technology. Um, Marcus, thank you. Thank you for for taking us and, of course, me as well through this journey uh, of being able to reminisce a little bit about the past. Uh, the good old days, if you will, of uh, complex, large, expensive type solutions and cameras to to where we are today with this uh, Internet of Things, industrial Internet of Things and and, and connected sensors. Um, thank you uh, for that yeah, uh, today. Yeah, yeah. My, my pleasure. That was, and, it was fun. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, and thank you to our audience for joining us and 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 going through this uh, this journey with us. This is this is the first of many episodes to come, where we'll be talking about new advancements and solutions to engineering problems and more uh, motion vision thermography uh, type applications. Uh, so we look forward to uh, uh, many more episodes and. Uh, and opportunities to meet with others as well as we discuss discuss about what's what's new, what's innovative and out there currently, and to help us make better solutions. But also, what are some of the things to come? Marcus, any any parting words uh, that you'd like to share with our audience? Yeah, I can I can't wait for the next um, episodes as well, and especially we have some fantastic uh, guest speakers lined up. I'm pretty excited about that. Um, you know what we have in store for our audience. I think it's going to be, uh, 
you know, very interesting and hopefully, uh, you know, some some good nuggets in there for people to listen in uh, and understand a little bit more about this this world that we live in every day and, and customers are, you know, exposed sometimes on the auxiliary, but um, I think it's going to be interesting. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Thank you so very much. Take care, everyone. Thank you. All right. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you.